Um, okay. To really comprehend the spirit behind the Cavalry Trilogy, it might be useful to link it with Ford's experience in the Second World War. So to start, I would like to take a look at Ford's filmography in the post-war years. Despite the end of hostilities, Ford continued to feed his obsession with war, mixing it with Westerns. The first post-war film is They Were Expendable. I'm sorry. They Were Expendable, um, followed a year after by My Darling Clementine, a war movie and a Western. Between 44, 45 and 52, Ford made 12 movies, of which six are Westerns and four are war films, as I reported here in this slide. Both his biographers, Gallagher and McBride, explained how deep and important was for Ford the experience on the war front. According to Gallagher, in a time span of three years, from 42 to 44, the years of war, approximately 100 films was credited John Ford and labeled as training, coverage, and reportage documentaries. The most well known of them is, of course, the, the Battle of Midway, on which many anecdotes were told, bringing to his persona, as it were possible, a more mythic and romantic aura. Two are the aspects that I want to highlight as a reflection of the profound transformation he had undergone in the World War II. First, a psychological response to a traumatic event. Facing the threat of war, putting in danger his values and tradition, Ford tried to keep them alive in the minds of his fellow citizens uh, with the aid of the pioneer America. In 49, he explicitly told a correspondent that making Western pictures and showing that period of American history, uh, quote, has been a crusade with me since the war, unquote. According to McBride, it was at that pivotal moment in the history of Hollywood that occurred the famous act of self-definition, my name is John Ford, I'm a director of Westerns, obviously connecting it to a precise political agenda. Secondly, the mixing of these two different genres in his mind contributed to stiffen a bit his idea of the frontier. One of the best ways to catch this change would be, if I had time, to compare his pre-war masterpiece, Stagecoach, to My Darling Clementine, the first post-war Western, mostly through the noticeable differences between those two towns, Larsburg and Tombstone, in spite of their names. Those thematic and stylistic dichotomies between pre-war and post-war Westerns resounded in a way what has been defined as a general tendency. This is the main point of Michael Coyne, uh, who in his volume on the national identity in Hollywood Westerns entitled The Crowded Prairie, pointed out that the majority of pre-war Western were biographical reconstructions or nation-building epics based on folk histories and populistic anecdotes, while after the World War II, they left part of their realistic description of historical past, even though it was a realism in quotation marks, to include pompous glorification and sometimes pure jingoism. Given this premise, it would be preferable to consider the Cavalry Trilogy as a whole, influenced by macro-political vision, an epitome of the ideological concerns of the World War II and the Cold War. I want to briefly explain this argument through three main points. First, the strict division of space. In all three movies, the great American landscape is represented through a symbolic conception of the border between home, the fort, and the savage wilderness, the space outside the fort. Second, through a melodramatic background, it demonizes Indians and celebrates the cavalry. Following the chronological order of, of the trilogy, we see that the Indians became more and more identified with an horrific presence. Ford gives a more explicit and dreadful expression to this horror and violence as he moves from Fort Apache, on which the Indians are only on the warpath, to Rio Grande, where the acts of violence are disgusting and awful, involving women and children. When the troops discover Corporal Bell's wife raped and mutilated in Rio Grande, the corpse is hidden from us, but we can see the degree of evilness through the reactions on face of Captain Saint Jacques, who whispers in French, in French, que bête sauvage, barbare. I hope I 
wrote it correctly. Later, in the church sequence, the Indians appear as degenerate, drunk on tequila, and bewildered into a vengeance dance, reassured with being on the other side of the Rio Grande River, where the cavalry cannot reach them. While in the other two films, the Indians at least speak intelligible words in English or Spanish, in Rio Grande, they just utter war cries with oddly pitched voices, numbed as they are with drink or madness. To the other side, the cavalry is a microcosm. It is a metonymy of American democracy, reminding us the cauldron of the front, the ethnic melting pot of the troops, the American troops, with an image long nurtured in the national mythology related to the World War II. In Rio Grande, we have the French Captain Saint Jacques, in Yellow Ribbon, the, the Irish Dr. O'Laughlin and Surgeon Queen Cannon. In Fort Apache, many Irish surgeons and a Latin Surgeon Beaufort. They are all displaying the same sense of duty, willing to sacrifice their own lives for the highest values. The third point is the fact that on this melodramatic background, duty and violence are often paired, resounding a Shakespearean dilemma. We do not have to forget that Clementine, the first in this different period, mirrors the famous Hamlet soliloquy. Taking arms against the sea of troubles is a form of duty, the growing out of a conscience. From the Puritan's era, religious conscience and violence have been in a way overlapped. And this is the pioneer America that Ford mainly wished to, to remind to his fellow citizens at that precise moment of history. To establish the new colony, the Europeans had to fight against unfamiliar environment, they had to displace natives and reservation, they had to enslave Ameri Africans. Violence and conflict have always been peculiar features in the process. But what was also distinctively American from the very beginning was the ideological background, a spiritual calling that explained or justified the colonies. The violence was part of many other countries' history, but the spiritual and symbolic significance that Americans assigned to their violence was definitely unique. The Second World War was not the only direct experience Ford had of a war front. His paternal grandfather was associated with the underground Fenian movement on behalf of Irish independence and was a forerunner of the Irish Republican Army. In 1921, Five years after Easter Rising and one year after Bloody Sunday, Ford left on a trip to Ireland. He was in Spiddle in Galway County, which is hometown of his father, where there had been military actions in 1916 during the War of Independence, and he wanted to help his family members named O'Finney, which was also the real name of Ford, Sean O'Finney, after receiving reports that were in political and financial troubles. According to McBride, Ford became contributor and collector of IRA funds during its continuing fight against British control of Northern Ireland. Usually, the first aspect that comes to mind when we think, when we think about the Irish characters in Ford's movies is their prodigious ability to hold large amount of liquor. Jeepa in The Informer, the matchmaker Micheline, played by Barry Fitzgerald in The Quiet Man, and almost all the scruffy drunkards his brother Frank played for him. I mean, the brother of, Fra of Ford, of John. In the trilogy, Ford softened the heroism of the cavalry through one of those wonderful depicted characters, in this, in this case played by Victor McLaglin. In Yellow Ribbon here, um, Surgeon Queen Cannon grabs whiskey with the same desire of a baby for a milk bottle and later sparks a drunken Donnybrook, which is an Irish word for uproar, for an uproar, in the saloon as a broad piece of slapstick comedy. Judging from these scenes, it seems that everyone in the audience thought that the Irish were among the booziest nation on earth and a notoriously belligerent bunch. But we should be aware of the fact that McLaglen is there for the same reason that stock characters like Papus and Bacchus are in the Atalan farce, or Trinculo and Stefano are in The Tempest. They furnish the comic sub subplot as a relief from the more serious problems of kings and dames. I'm not sure this is just racial stereotyping. The final episode, entitled 1921 of the Rising of the Moon, 
one of the most related to Ireland from Ford's films, tells the story of an Ira man who escapes from a British prison during the Black and Tan War, masqueraded as a nun. Act the dummy is the suggestion that two Irish warders exchanged to help him. Act the dummy. The stage Irish behavior seems one of the secret weapons the Irish people have evolved to manipulate and outwit their adversaries. And this is also part of a national character. According to Eagleton, and I'm quoting here, the Irish are superlative mockers, not least of themselves. They are allergic to pomp or pretentiousness and love nothing more than cutting them satirically down to size. This might be the reason of a coexistence of this low-key debunkery with Ford's proud hibernophilia, mostly noticeable in Fort Apache, uh, in the contrast between the Yankee Martinet Colonel Thursday, played by Harry Fonda, and Captain York, John Wayne, or Lieutenant O'Rourke. Few critics argue that Fordian Irishness in the Cavalry trilogy is simply linked to a recognition of the legacy of Irish Americans in the building of the nation. <coughs> I think otherwise that Ford's relationship with Ireland in the war and post-war years was also complicated by the aggressive, fierce, and proud diplomatic strategy of Ireland during World War II. According to De Tally, in this book that I quoted here, Irish neutrality during Second World War was not traditional neutrality. It, in, in any sense, it was incredibly beneficial to the Allies, but Prime Minister Amand de Valera was inflexible on the treaty parts. There you go, the treaty parts. They would have remained untouched and closed to the Royal Navy. De Valera insisted on neutrality as a method to safeguard Ireland, affirming an Irish identity separated from the British, sovereign, independent, and unite under one single nation rural and Catholic. The most important issue for the Valera was indeed to end the partition of Ireland that began with the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1921. In 39, he began a press campaign in the US giving a series of interviews to American newspapers calling for Irish-American support. We should also remind that by the year 1900, the majority of people who emigrated from Ireland traveled to the US generally coming from Southern Ireland, impoverished by the Great Famine. They formed a large percentage of Irish Americans in the US population. So the Valera, during those journeys in few American cities, tried to raise the partition issue directly with his fellow citizen, Irish citizen. For a nationalist and an extremist as it was, the whole existence of Northern Ireland was a remnant of a British imperialism. For him, the British presence in the North was scandalous and unbearable. After the war, with the growing Soviet-American split, de Valera accepted the Irish membership in the UN and Ireland was included in the Marshall Plan. The end of partition was not obtained and later would have produced many other problems that are still here. But in November 40, 1948, the government introduced the Republic of Ireland Act, which became law after the year after. 1948, 49, 50, those were the same years of the trilogy. Ford surely knew the implication of this complicated triangular relationship among Ireland, England, and US. He might have been critical of the Valera proud resistance, judging from his own involvement on the war front, at least as far as I can see. But when, after the war, the troubles smoothed over, was in Ford's interest maintaining a direct involvement in Irish economic development, endorsing its cause as a proud, independent, and separated nation, an idea that clashes with, or does not dovetail, the urge of recognize the legacy of Irish American in, building of the country, in the building of the country, the US country. To understand this problem, a case in point would be, again, the rising of the moon produced for an Irish company with an all Irish cast shot on location in 54 as an attempt to promote filmmaking in Ireland. It is well known, nonetheless, that Ford worked with a lot of Irish actors, actors and actresses, all but Victor McLaglen, who was born in London. In any case, every time an Irish soldier appeared on the trilogy, it was a feature differently perceived and understood by five million first or second generation Irish 
who lived in the US in the 1940s. The soundtrack can be an interesting focal point through which this aspect can be highlighted. Two songs are noteworthy in the trilogy. The first is the song Gary Owen. We hear the song in Yellow Ribbon, but mostly in Fort Apache. The title comes from two Gaelic words, and it refers to the area around King John's Castle um, in Limerick called Gary Owen. It later became the marching tune of the Seven Cavalry, and legend has it that it was introduced uh, to the US Cavalry by Major Miles Keogh, who was born a short distance from Limerick. Ford knew him, I mean, from the pages of history, and he is in fact remembered, Major Miles Keogh is in fact remembered in Yellow Ribbon by Captain Brittle, John Wayne, in one of his graveyard soliloquy in front of his dead wife's tomb, which is a trademark in Ford. The connection between Gary Owen and the Seven Cavalry was already cemented by the popularity of the score Max Steiner wrote for the Raoul Walsh film They Die With The Boots On, which opened in 1941 as a romanticized Caster biopic. But this version lacked to recognize the connection with the Irish history. In They Died, uh, Caster first heard the song played by Lieutenant Queen's own butler. He's an Englishman, not an Irish, a detail that is made clear clear through everything. His funny name, obviously made up, uh, his accent, his physiognomy. Otherwise, in Fort Apache, Ford decided to use the song in instrumental arrangements only, omitting references to the glorifying lyric added later when the song was inherited by the cavalry. He wanted to emphasize the song's identification with the Irish movement for independence. In Ford's view, the song became connected with an uncertain and demanding task as in his romantic vision the Irish rebe rebellion must have been, and indeed it was, considering the numbers, 1,200 volunteers against 16,000 British troops. It is heard, in fact, in the movie, when the troops are leaving the fort, shortly before the last stand. While Walsh set the last stand into a collective and national mythology, in fort the last stand acquired a more personal and intimate significance. And this is why I think Walsh's version is more clear-cut, as ordered and immaculate as men's temperaments and uniforms. The second song is Down by the Glenside, more commonly known as the Bold Fenian Man, which can be heard in Rio Grande. According to Catherine Kalinak, this song is, was composed in 1916, 16, it's an important date, uh, the War of Independence, by Pedro Carney, Irish Republican and composer of many rebel songs. The rebel songs in Irish law represents a very important tradition in Ireland because they, they acclaimed the deeds of the Irish rebels in the past and they had to rekindle within men the revolutionary fervor. Composed in the midst of the rebellion, 1916, this song commemorates an earlier failed rebellion organized by the Fenian movement in 1867 when the Fenians bombed Clerkenwell, a prison in London where one of them was incarcerated. For British audiences in the year 1950 of the movie, Bold Fenian Man could have been a potentially incendiary song, while Irish Americans would have gotten the illusion in a different way. And I'd like to show you this. The regimental singers would like to sing a traditional song, sir, for in 31, and he later became a Fenian sympathizer. The American Fenian Brotherhood made overtures to him to accept the position of Secretary of War in connection with their failed plan to invade Canada and attack the British, a plan that should have occurred in the same decade that was remembered in the song about the Clerkenwell prison. The Irishness of the general is completely emphasized in, Rio, in Ford's Rio Grande, if we compare it to the same figure in Walsh as they died. Sheridan in Walsh is a, figure, is a positive figure, but cold and inflexible, while in Ford acquires an offhand quality and an unceremonious way of acting that is totally absent in Walsh's version. Rio Grande bears the stamp of Ford's most reactionary Cold War political film, mostly because of him of General Sheridan, who imposes a more strong line of action against the marauding Apache across the Rio Grande River in Mexico. 
But if you look at the church scene in the Mexican village, we could also see that behind the perversity of the enemy, there is this romantic and brighton idea that fought out of a little Catholic church to be defended against brutality, echoing the 1946 film The Fugitive. When the rescue operation starts, one of the girls begin, begins to ring the church bell, a, sing, a sign that serves to localize a place, but also a clear synonym of a religious call. Even more clearly, in opening fire, they use a window of a holy cross. Later, uh, Surgeon Queen Cannon does not forget to genuflect in front of the altar before leaving the church. Those are clear symbolisms showing support to Irish Catholicism in the religious a religious clash occurring on both sides of the Atlantic. And I'm concluding. Ford always indulged himself in, celebrate, in celebration of the militaristic societies and rituals. The myth is good for the country. But at the same time, he always found ways to approach the puritanical imperialistic foundations of the Western frontier with a substratum of subversive, at least ambivalent, attitude of an offhand Irish rebel and a Catholic. His Irishness, starting from the tradition of comic voice for the heroes, ends up as a pian to rebellion, to strong and fierce individualism. So it seems to me that Ford's Irishness can be considered a very interesting perspective around which the American imperialism of the trilogy finds adjustment and revisions. Being Irish for him always meant being on both sides of the epic, as Ford himself said in the statement that I wanted to quote it entirely. And I'm quoting here, who better, who better than the Irishman could understand the Indians while still being stirred by the tales of the U.S. cavalry? We were on both sides of the epic. Think, uh, end of quote. Thinking in terms of transnationalism, we might remind that we should no longer be confined to unilateral perspectives when a popular object like a Western movie, also in the golden era, is transferred and addressed to different audiences. In this case, too, it is a matter of being on both sides of the epic with ambiguous and unpredictable results. Thank you.